Welcome back. Are we, Mr. Chairman, are we ready to begin panel two? For panel two, again, a reminder um, to please refrain from discussing specific details of pending contested FERC proceedings listed on the notices for this conference and other pending contested proceedings. If anyone engages in these discussions, I will interrupt the discussion to ask the speaker to avoid that topic. For this panel on concerns for winter 22-23 and future winters, our panelists are Carrie Allen, Senior Vice President and Deputy General Counsel, Constellation Energy Corporation, Jay Riley Allen, Commissioner, Vermont Public Utility Commission, David Cavanaugh, Senior Vice President, Regulatory and Market Affairs, Energy New England, Karen Yumpen, Vice President, Origination, Repsol, Mike Noland, Manager, Forecast and Scheduling, ISO New England, Richard Paglia, Vice President, Marketing and Business Development, Enbridge, and John Rudiak, Senior Director of Energy Supply, Avangrid Incorporated, on behalf of the New England LDC Group. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mary. So uh, we were not going to have any opening statements or presentations, so we'll get right into the questions. We'll have more time for a back and forth discussion. And we're going to go in reverse order uh, this time of seniority and start with Commissioner Phillips to ask some questions. I've had an elevation in status here. Okay. All right. Thank you all for coming today. Um, you know, my, my initial questions for this panel, it's really simple. We heard a little bit about Everett in the last panel. And uh, of course, we're not going to talk about it all that. I think we need to talk about it a little bit. And uh, one of my questions is, can anyone on the panel who wants to address it, can you talk about what are some of the reliability benefits of, of Everett and, uh, and where do you see the role in long-term contracting with regard to Everett? Please. I thought I'd raise my placard for that one. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I've learned a lot about Everett since we acquired it in 2018. Um, it offers a multitude of benefits for the region. I think I'm not sure how much people know about the pressure support and balancing and shaping service that Everett provides, but just to give you a sense of the numbers, over the last two, um, two years, predominantly in the winter, Everett's been called on 21 times to provide pressure support intraday um, for the systems uh, to which it's interconnected. We've also provided balancing and shaping plus or minus you know, 10,000 MMBTU 25 times. In the previous year, uh, previous two years before that, it was 69 times that we have documented that we have provided that service. Um, in, in addition, on um, January 11th this year, that was a day that was called out by ISO New England in its presentation. That happened to be a day where we had 325,000 MMBTU of send out besides Mystic. So that's two other entities. So I do think Everett can critically contribute to um, reliability in New England. One of the other benefits is Everett's already permitted. It's existing. It's been operating reliability, uh, reliably for 50 years. So um, it's it's not a question of, you know, will it be here? It's here. The question is, do you want to keep it here? Um, uh, in, a, in addition, I think that um, there's an environmental impact to maintaining Everett. If you were to conservatively assume that um, it provides 10,000 uh, MMBTU of gas um, to peaking generators in the system, uh, if that were to go away, you'd double um, your carbon dioxide emissions. You'd, our calculations show that you would um, increase NOx emissions by 74%, and carbon dioxide would increase 48-fold. Uh, so um, the, the gas, while it's not as clean as the um, you know, production that comes out of the nuclear power plants that my company owns, um, it still is cleaner than, than what the alternative is on the New England system. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I'll, I can stop there for a moment. You have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. You want to weigh in? Thank you, and uh, thank you again for the opportunity to participate in today's panel. You know, public power, its first, reliability, first issue is reliability. So having another stored fuel resource in the region that provides some competition with other stored fuel resources is very helpful to us. 
It certainly is a local resource that does provide the benefit of having the injections into the system. It feeds the other gas generators on the system. So for us, it's having that stored fuel in the region provide competition with other stored fuel resources and, of course, to the extent where it's possible price benefit. So that's really it. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for um, uh, allowing us to share our perspective. Um, good morning. Um, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't actually minimize the benefits of Everett, but I'd also want to make sure that the panel understood or the commission understood that there are other resources within the region that provide just as much critical um, stored energy for the region. Um, and specifically speaking to the Everett day, the 320,000 uh, a day that they were injecting into the system to other users, on that particular day we exceeded 700,000 out of our terminal. Uh, Repsol actually represents the largest stored energy um, in the region. We have 10 BCF of storage at our facility and we have a BCF um, of capacity to be able to send that out to other, actually the local distribution companies as well as generators in the region. Um, we reach four different pipelines, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I'm not minimizing their importance. I'm just wanting to stress that uh, we're just as critical. Um, same with Accelerate and the Northeast Gateway. All three of the LNG terminals that bring that stored energy or stored fuel to the, the region um, are needed. Um, they're dependent upon winter over win winter, and, and I, I would like to make sure that this conversation wasn't just about Everett, no different than everybody else, um, but I, I need to stress that there are other LNG terminals. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for the, for the question. Uh, from the ISO's point of view, um, I'm looking at this holistically from uh, the ability to get fuel to generators. Everett provides that conduit of getting world LNG into New England to get the, uh, the energy supplies that we need into the region in order to serve the demand uh, in, in New England, both from an electrical point of view and from a gas point of view. Um, th there are mo multiple LNG terminals, as we're all, as we're all aware. Um, but having the additional LNG terminal at Everett provides us for that additional conduit, the additional storage, the additional vapor vaporization capability uh, to serve the demand for New England and to ensure that when I call for a generator as an operator inside the control room at ISO New England, that they're going to have a better opportunity to have the fuel that they need to operate on the day we call them. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. I thought I might respond to your question from a pipeline operator's perspective. Um, uh, we operate the Maritimes and Northeast system, the Algonquin pipeline system, and Texas Eastern serving this particular region and are connected to all of the, um, uh, the LNG import facilities noted. And, and as Karen mentioned and Carrie Allen, they do tre provide tremendous benefit from a pressure support uh, and supply standpoint uh, to the pipelines in the region. Uh, and we, um, we hope that continues. Our concern is um, we've seen a marked decline in supply coming into those facilities. We talked about some of the reasons why already, um, but that is a major concern from an operator of the pipeline standpoint is, you know, will it be there in the future? And, and there's a cost aspect to it as well that, that's also been touched upon. So um, absolutely, see the value and the continuing operation of those facilities, but I think we need to think more broadly. Um, you heard about some projects that, that our company had put forward in the past. Um, other pipelines in the area also have projects on the table. We needed all of the above as it relates to not only technologies going forward, but also natural gas infrastructure. Um, you know, to simply rely on imported LNG, I think, uh, we all know the risks associated with that. It's an important part, piece of the puzzle, but it's not the only piece. And um, I hope today to have a chance to talk to you a little more about some of those other opportunities. Um, but I think uh, hopefully we can leave here today stacking hands, uh, at least to the extent that we need to do something on both the supply and infrastructure side as it relates to natural gas um, to move the needle on this conversation that, that candidly has been going on much too long. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, and FERC staff. Thank, thank you for the opportunity for the New England LDCs to participate. 
Uh, so the Everett Terminal has been in service for about 50 years, and it's now more important than ever as we look into the future. So from an LDC perspective, some of the LDCs have long-term contracts with the Everett Terminal. Um, some of the LDCs depend upon uh, or, or include in their portfolio liquid refill in the wintertime from the LNG facility at Everett via truck to refill their facilities because some of those facilities only have two or three days worth of gas in, in storage. Um, Everett's a very flexible resource uh, in terms of its turn on and turn, turn off capability. I know there's been instances where it's provided um, kind of near emergency condition support for the pipeline network and uh, for LDCs. Um, I think the bottom line from an Everett perspective is we need Everett um, for the foreseeable future. We need Repsol for the foreseeable future, Accelerate. We need all the infrastructure we can get given the circumstances. So um, we agree with the, the last panel from that perspective in terms of infrastructure. Gas infrastructure is needed, electric infrastructure, wind power, transmission projects such as the New England Clean Energy Connect, uh, very important projects. So we, need, uh, we need those to move forward as soon as possible. And, uh, but we need gas infrastructure and perhaps um, it seems like we also will need um, gas pipeline infrastructure. I want to also point out the LDCs are continuing to grow and uh, at a relatively low pace, but we're continuing to experience demand growth. And so we're gonna need something to address that demand growth, be it increased LNG, infrastructure, additional conservation, demand side management. We're gonna need all of the above to, uh, to uh, continue to serve our customers reliably, which is the most important thing. Thank you for that. I will exercise caution and stop my questions right there and turn it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Commissioner Phillips. Commissioner Christie. I'll wait and hear from all the speakers before maybe having a question or two. Thank okay. you. Okay, you reserve your right, as they say. Um, I'll move on to Commissioner Clements. Well, I'm still stuck in the middle either way, so I'll, I'll just ask um, one question. You know, I'm hearing kind of three sets of ideas of, of solutions. We're still, today's problem day, but it's hard to avoid the solutions. One is, you know, build new infrastructure, right? Two is diversify fuel sources, and three is decrease demand. And all of those things happen in different time frames. Um, and, and it's really important to understand. So if we're thinking about the needs 10 years from now where these medium to longer term solutions can come into play, do we need them then? And so my, my one question is for you, uh, Mr. Nolan, uh, you know, the, the presentation from was kind of high level trends around the region, um, and it was very educational. It didn't have any specific analysis you know, scenario analysis around what the energy security risk is, what the winter reliability risk is in the next five to 10 years, um, you know, sensitivities around high gas demand, low gas demand, the impact of these policies, whether these diversified resources come online. And so when we talk about these solutions that are all, all involve investment and all involve consideration by either this commission or uh, our, our colleagues at the states, have you done that analysis and how, and how can we get that analysis to match then these potential different time frames? Uh, thank, thank you, Commissioner. The uh, <clears throat> sensitivity analysis that's um, that, that's being contemplated is, is something that is ongoing work. Um, the work that we've done so far is an analysis of this coming winter uh, that ran through three somewhat specific scenarios of previous winters and their impact on what it would look like if we were to experience a winter of 13, 14, 17, 18, and then just a mild winter like last year. And, and we went through the range of, of what the possibilities would be like in, a, um, in both a contingency um, scenario, where if we were to lose a large source of, of uh, fuel stable uh, electric supply, uh, like a nuclear station or, so, or something to that nature, um, based on the, the impact of each different winter's uh, demand forecast for electric and, and gas. Uh, the sensitivity analysis, analysis that you're asking about is a project that's ongoing. Uh, we're working with EPRI, uh, where results of that are, are looking at future winters and the impact of uh, more extreme weather and a variety of, of different weather that we would expect to see in, in, the, in the future years. The results of that are expected to be later this year into early next year. Uh, so it's not something I have in front of me right now. It's not something that's even be completed being worked on at the moment, uh, but it is something that is actively being pursued. Um, I 
Thanks. It seems like that's going to be a really important piece, and I think to the extent that the ISO can provide that kind of analysis, um, you know, in its in in the planning process, as we think about which pieces of these puzzles we're we're going to address and how, uh, that'll be really helpful. Thanks. That's all for me. Thanks, Commissioner Clements. Commissioner Danley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, the uh, the I. I I have a specific question or a general question for you, Mr. Kavanaugh, but I ask specifically because I'm always interested to hear uh, public power talk about every issue that comes up. They just have a different set of incentives from IOUs and from regulators. So uh, just w w your members, generally speaking, are going to feel the, the rate effects of the policies in the region differently, I would think, from others. So can you just talk about that? It's an open-ended question, however you see fit to address it. You know, and thank you for the question. You know, I go back to some of the main principles, right? Reliability, least cost, competitive power, and then they're decarbonizing their portfolios. But when we look at some of the past winter programs, we supported those. We thought they were appropriate to maintain reliability during the winter. We would support when now if the conditions were correct. As you know, we've litigated the current uh, RMR and the IEP program as well to make sure that the costs are appropriate to the benefits we're receiving. And so now we're seeing the first RMR contract uh, costs coming out, and they're substantial to our consumers. And so to your broader question, uh, we're looking at reliability for the region, what are the solutions are, and then we would then look at what that cost is worth. And we really would like to look at the incremental value that is needed to cover the gap that the market doesn't provide. So in the broad view, this is impactful to us. Uh, right now we're paying like 1.4 mils per kWh on the RMR contract. On a, on systems that are putting in all in costs at 15 cents a kW, that's impactful over time and it's impactful to their budget. So the, the question is going to be for us is what is the ultimate analysis of what we need? What's the solution look like or solutions? And what do those cost? And that's very important to our rate payers and overall health and well-being of our region. Hopefully that's responsive to your question. Yes, yeah, so, so the, you know, the, the way I see this playing out over the long term I think is that the um, it's not a matter of simply forcing, although although dispatchable generation is being forced out by state policies, um, it's not going to be gotten rid of. They're going to be maintained on those expensive RMRs to the extent necessary, or maybe just a little bit less than necessary to keep the system stable. Right? We don't know exactly what's going to happen, and it's hard to plan for contingencies like that. But if the market mechanisms fail to keep the resources necessary to keep the system stable, there are going to be uh, uh, premiums paid for the the attributes needed to keep things running. That is a bad way to run a market, right? RMRs are not only uh, signs of market failures, they themselves cause price distortions and we should have as few of them as possible anywhere in, in any market. Uh, so the, 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 the question I have is, does anybody disagree with that general outlook that I just gave, that this is going to be a slow slouching towards further and further inefficiency? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident in that assessment, which is why I'm specifically asking if people disagree, although you can also raise the chorus of the hallelujahs if you agree with me. Okay, go ahead. Yep. Uh, so again, you know, I, I think your concerns are valid, and, and we, I think my colleague Tom Castle mentioned that. You know, to the extent we should be exploring what the market can provide in, in terms of competitive solutions, that's beneficial to us, and narrow the amount of out-of-market solutions we need to face, because for us, we would have to pay through, pay that price to a non-hedged commodity, right? It's it's a cost over a long period of time. I'm sorry, so I just missed you. Say that one more time. You have to pay the cost to what? We would, we'd pay that RMR cost as an, a non-hedged commodity. It's oh, a yeah, pass-through. Yeah. And so that's impactful. And so we would prefer a contested solution in a competitive environment that gives us the lowest cost price. But we recognize right now there's a disconnect between the market and what drives infrastructure in the region. And we realize that that gap's got to be filled. And we're looking to see what is that gap and what does it cost us and how do we get to that solution at, at least cost possible. So to change subject slightly, you talk about being the operator in a control room and you want to make sure that when you call on the gas generator, they're actually there. So the question I have is, by, by, how can one be sure in a constrained region that the gas generator is going to be there if we don't let them have firm fuel? Because the market structure is such that if you bid in those costs, you're in kind of a bad position. Is there a way to fix that problem absent some sort of extra payment that would cover that? And am I wrong in the premise of the question that that is a fundamental problem that can't be gotten, gotten around? 
So, so I agree, uh, Commissioner. Thank you. I, I agree that the that there is there is concern that there's that there's going to be fuel available to the resources when I when I ask them to come online, whether or not that's a that's a market solution or uh, an, another solution. Uh, I I can't disagree with uh, wh whether that's that's good or bad for you know for pricing. Um, I, I'm an operator, and I, I, again, I apologize. That okay, I'll handle I the pricing part then. But but for the for the but operator stuff, the, the operator needs needs the fuel to be there, and and we can we can talk about it being whatever whatever type of solution that that it needs to be. But but to to continue to look at this at the set of problems and proposing different solutions uh, without a clear path forward, and 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 I know that's why we're here uh, to to start working on that clear path forward. Um, that there's that significant risk. We have the capacity. We have the iron in the ground. The infrastructure is there. Now it's a matter of of utilizing it and making sure that we have the fuel that's that's flowing through that infrastructure and the and, and getting it to the burner tips for both the generators and 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 the gas utilities. I understand that this is a this is a co-optimized system. This is a system that works together, uh, and and we're dependent on each other. And I understand that. Um, the the type of solution that that we're going to come to when it, when we solve this problem. Uh, that, that's something I'm, I'm not necessarily the expert on, and I apologize for that. But but I but I do agree that, you know, that there needs to be one. And I guess uh, I guess maybe putting this a little bit more simply, I appreciate. It. You're sitting in the control room, and you call on the natural gas generator at a time of constraint and, and serious cold that's been going on for a while. Are you worried that in fact they're going to respond and say, "Sorry, can't help you"? Sure. Um, and we've done a lot of work to to maximize the utilization of the infrastructure that we have in place. Uh, and I can talk for hours if you'd like on that. I'd like um, you to talk for not hours about it. A couple of minutes <laughs> would be a couple of moments about that. Would I can nice. certainly talk quickly. Uh, first quarter 787, and thank you for that, uh, allows us to have that open discussion with the pipelines uh, to best ascertain what the capabilities of the pipelines are going to be and the LNG facilities to provide the gas to the generators. Uh, we, we know the status of the oil inventories of generators. We know before we call that generator whether they're going to be able to run or not. Um, we have, as I mentioned, open communications with the pipelines. We have um, the information that we need from the pipelines that's publicly available through the electronic bulletin boards that we scrape and we put into our tools to calculate how much fuel a generator needs to meet their, uh, their required run for the operating day. And we make that comparison automatically through, the, through a set of tools that we have uh, and make the phone calls to the generators to alert them to the fact that we know we know that they don't have the gas scheduled and that they're, that they're expected to perform. They know they're expected to perform their, to their capacity supply obligations. How do, how do those calls go? The calls go well enough. I think the calls are more, more of an alert that uh, we, we know that they're deficient. And again, this is publicly available information from the gas side. So we get that from the electronic bulletin boards. Uh, the calls are more to the point where we have the ability to get gas and we will. And we understand that. And, you know, sometimes that's an alert to, to wake them up and go get gas. Sometimes it's, it's an alert that, yes, we have a plan and we know, we know that we're able to get fuel. Um, we send the expected dispatch of generators uh, for the next day to the pipeline operators so that they're able to corroborate that against the information that they get from the generators as well. Uh, they can compare that and they can inform me personally. They will call me and tell me that you're expecting from a generator gas that they can't get or, or for, for one reason or another or it's not scheduled at this point. If there's an operational flow order in place, et, et cetera, and, and, and issues like that where um, the supply could be potentially at risk, the real answer comes from gas control. And we have that through FERC Order 787. Um, and the last thing that I'll, that I'll bring up and I'll mention in that is, is the display. The, the display of, of near real-time information to our system operators on a 70-inch screen right inside the control room, uh, available at every desk inside the ISO that is our gas utilization tool. It shows gas scheduled at each meter that is uh, serving a generator. It shows gas schedules along the, uh, along the pipelines at each, uh, at each point. It gives a one-line display of where the, where the generators are situated to compressor stations, and it gives our operators the situational awareness they need to maybe not answer the question of are we going to be reliable today from that one place, but I just mentioned six things that start that conversation, and that gives us the situational awareness we need in the control room to, to make the decisions uh, to keep the system operating reliably. So absent some 
ridiculous black swan event, you're probably going to have a, a you're going to have visibility on the freight train if there is one heading towards you before it arrives, right? If a problem is on the horizon, you'll see it. But that n isn't going to change the fact that if, in fact, the commodity is not available, it's not available even if that unavailability is down the road a couple days. And so the question becomes, given the fact that the Commission has limited jurisdiction, very narrow jurisdiction, to do things having to do with rates, is what, what can we do? And this is not a question for the operator, don't worry. What can we, what can we do uh, using our rate powers to, to either be in receipt of a tariff revision that is going to assist in ensuring that that commodity is available? I, I, I should pause for a minute. I really appreciated the problem statement that ISO New England put out. And um, uh, it, it, it put in fairly, I, I would say, stark terms what the region is facing. And, and for anybody who has not read it, I would, I would hope everybody has who's in the room. If they're interested enough to be here, they should have read the problem statement. There are, there are problems that, that are, are profound, and the question I keep coming back to is the one that I just articulated. What can FERC do, given our rate authority, to, to f fix the problem? And so that is the one that I will open it up to. And, and for, for timing, do you want to, is, are we good with that? Yeah, okay, yep. So then that's the question I'll throw open for, for people to answer. Um, we can just go down the line. Sure. Um, so I actually had my placard up from the, R, uh, the colloquy about the RMRs. Okay, and I, 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 I did it again. What, we can go back to that for you to answer that one, so go yeah. ahead. So I'll, I'll, I'll just say first off, you know, we're eager for the RMR to um, end. Um, uh, no one's more eager at my company probably than me. Um, but we do, I was hoping when we came here that we'd have an opportunity to talk a little bit about what happens after the RMR is over. And what do we do, um, you know, we ha our experience is that there's been quite a bit of interest in contracts with um, our facility for supply from our facility post RMR. But there seems to be a bit of a regulatory problem and we're trying to work it through um, in terms of the state approval process. And so that was one of, you know, as I came here, I thought, this is a real opportunity. This is one time where I can say, maybe it's not necessarily something FERC can do, but um, we have an opportunity to address some of these regulatory problems. And specifically, I am speaking to um, the fact that there, I think there's a perception among some of our counterparties um, that they need to have fixed commodity pricing to take that to, let's say, a Massachusetts DPU for approval. My understanding is that is not the legal standard, and it's also not something that we can provide and hold open for a nine-month period while we're waiting for that regulatory approval. So it's an issue that I'm putting on the table. It's something that folks could do near term to add that clarity to the market, so perhaps we could facilitate contracts. I think one thing that FERC could possibly do is um, you've heard a little bit about how Everett supports the pipelines. And I think there's general agreement that additional pipeline infrastructure is needed in New England, right? Um, but it's not going to be here um, in 2024, right? It's not going to be here for several years. I think there are instances where FERC has looked at um, reliability on the pipelines and allowed the pipelines to recover for measures that they take to increase reliability. So I could see a circumstance where if um, the pipelines think it's merited, they could contract with, with Everett and um, pursue a reliability-based charge to make sure that that pressure support and balancing and shaping service is their post cost of service. My advice on that last is that you get clever with your, your filings and you come and talk to commission staff and talk to the commissioners beforehand, right? That uh, the, I, I think I, I speak for probably all of us saying that, that thoughtful and, and forward-leaning filings are, are going to be entertained, you know, uh, with open minds if they help the problem. So thank you. Going back to my previous question, or my later question, uh, the, what can we do with our rate authorities to change the fact that if the gas isn't there or to incentivize the fact that, that there are con real constraints for gas and it may not be there when we need it. So anybody who has ideas on that, knowing the constraints that we, the commission, have under the law. So, yep. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think Actually, I have yeah. my placard yeah. up. Yep, go, go ahead. Yep. But I don't know what the protocols are. Um, and actually, I'd, I'd actually take it back to your original question when you asked the ISO New England, how can they be sure um, that there will be fuel there when they ask? Um, I know 
when uh, fuel will be there, and that's when the market has prearranged for that fuel to show up. We're not like the electricity. We require, it's not like when we want it, we make it. Um, we require prior arrangement to ensure that that fuel is in the tank. I think to answer your second question about how FERC facilitates that is, is really in um, market mechanisms in which market signals can be given to all participants within that market um, to prearrange for that fuel. Um, the other thing that I also would feel very remiss if I didn't get a chance to in, uh, explain to you, LNG is reliable and can be very reliable. I, I think Japan is a very good example of how you use LNG as a fuel and, and, it is, and how reliable it can be. Um, that's if you prearrange for it. Um, and so, f I mean, you say that, but, mm -hmm. but I have to tell you that given the fact that LNG is so valuable these days, I, I really do imagine a circumstance in which Germany could need LNG so badly that, that the people that you, you know, your reliable counterparties that you've had good relationships with for years would start contemplating efficient breach because the difference between any utility in New England and Germany is that Germany can print its own money. And so I, I, would, I, I wouldn't really rely on your counterparties as strongly as maybe you have in the past. It's just a word of warning to everybody. Um, if you want to ad address the source of the supply because you're concerned about global markets, you can produce LNG in North America. Um, it's called liquefaction. Um, and liquefying natural gas um, it, in the summertime, storing it for the wintertime is an efficient use of the infrastructure that we have. Um, I think that's one of the many solutions that I think that need to be explored for the region. Um, Presumably not for this winter, though. Uh, that, that would be correct. Um, but, like, I, I use the gas markets within New England also as a, as a good, good example of how in which they prearrange for their peak day. They go through a forecasting mechanism, long term and short term. Um, from that, they actually go out and contract for the fuel that they require. And I don't have many concerns when it comes to the gas market because of how in which they've gone forward and contracted for what it, it, it needs. I have that concern with the power market. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Kavanaugh. Yeah, and thank you. And I think certainly the ISO problem statement pointed to some of the issues that the delinkage between long-term load deals and driving infrastructure. From our perspective, we our only long-term deals are carbon-free. The rest is short-term system mix, maybe five years or less. But structurally, you can't gas generators can't capture the cost of long-term contracts or cost of firm pipe in their bids, either in the in the forward market FCM or in the energy market. It's just not allowed to be recovered there. Don't know what that would play out as, but certainly if you built that in and there's a loud capture of that in their offers, perhaps then we can see that from the load side, it's just built into commodities we're buying. It's, it's a way of getting at it. Don't know how that plays out because you then have the concerns about can you get anything built in the region in terms of infrastructure support that. But uh, it's within your authority, I believe, in rate terms and conditions of the marketplace that it could be evaluated as a smaller view of what are some solutions. Okay. Um. Yeah, just a brief comment to underscore Mike's um, comments around the coordination. Uh, we do a great job. The pipelines, the LNG import companies, the ISOs, there's nothing left there to extract in terms of optimization. There's a lot of conversation. Oh, we can do more on the coordination. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I think it's worth saying again. This is a supply and infrastructure issue. And if we don't all hold hands on that, um, we're going to hear things from ISO and others about we hope for a mild to moderate winter. We hope for new technologies to come along. Hope is not a strategy. And if we continue to rely on that, one day we're going to find ourselves uh, probably very soon, sadly, uh, in a very bad place. So. I think that's important to note um, as part of Mike's comments. We do, we do everything we can, and, and honestly, the people around this table have kept the lights on. I think Mike and ISO would agree with that. In circumstances that, quite frankly, were extremely challenged. In the LDCs, I, 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 I forgot to acknowledge them. But there is tremendous coordination, but we have a challenge as it relates to firm supply and infrastructure. Thank you.
So, so I, I appreciate all that. The, the, do you have an answer to the specific question about what we can do with our rate authorities to help the problem of actually getting gas to where it has to go? Or, or we are getting gas to where it has to go, but making sure that we can get it under uh, times of, of constraints. Yeah, so I think the simplest way to think about it from my standpoint is who pays, right? We, we, need, we need a contract with a willing counterparty and they need to be able to recover that cost in some way, shape, or form. I think that's where the, the challenge has always arisen. And I, I don't mean to make my comments seem like they're easy to solve. They're not. We've been at this for a long time, myself for over 25 years, trying to come forward with creative ways to find that willing counterparty. Um, and we failed to date. And you know, I don't know that there's a simple path forward other than to say, there has to be an appetite for these costs to be passed through. At the end of the day, someone's paying for this. Right now, it's our, it's our retail customers in, in New England. Um, there's a benefit associated with new infrastructure. It's been talked about at length. You build more infrastructure, you reduce prices, everybody benefits. So there has to be a willingness to step up and pay for the investment in order to bring forward the benefits. And I think that's where we could look to you to help us um, identify that new infrastructure, identify and approve those willing counterparties and move forward with additional development. I'm still struggling to figure out exactly what the tariff provision would look like that would help, but um, thank you. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. So at the, <clears throat> at the risk of stating the obvious, reliability is way too important uh, uh, at this point. So um, we need to, it's, it's an urgent situation in our view at this point from the LDC perspective because um, some of the risks associated with the so-called just-in-time contracting and lack of incentives have kind of spilled over to the gas customer perspective in terms of we're concerned about low pressure gas systems uh, in terms of rolling blackouts and we're concerned about uh, other pressure events, et cetera. But to get to your question, um, Commissioner Danley, in terms of what the commission can do, first of all, it's very important to continue this dialogue on an expedited basis with an eye toward solutions, uh, first of all. But in terms of rate authority, um, perhaps tariff changes with respect to firm fuel, winter reliability programs can be reinstated. Um, the energy reserve approach, um, et cetera. But at this point, it, 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 we're at the stage where we need to pull out more stops and take a more aggressive action. We've been working on this topic for quite a long time, and, uh, and the situation has become um, more in a, in, a, in a more desperate situation to deal with. Um, what do you say? Oh, yeah, yeah, please, go ahead. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, Commissioner. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just um, uh, emphasize some of the uh, points that made by uh, others. I mean, the, the tariff authority can go in different directions and um, uh, can result in the approval of cost of service uh, arrangements. Uh, there are market mechanisms. There's a market design. We've talked about the uh, energy reserve mechanism. Uh, but these are, these are all things that I, I think are, you know, not within, you know, the time frames of the urgency of, of, of this year. And uh, that, um, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I, what I, I'm hoping for, and, uh, you know, my, the reason I wanted to participate in this panel <clears throat> was the opportunity to kind of speak to uh, getting off of uh, the, the, uh, the cycle of having the same conversations over and over again, and uh, really focusing on lasting and uh, um, uh, you know solutions that will have impact in in the coming winters as well. Well, let's hear it. <laughs> what, do you, what do you what do you have? <laughs> sure, thanks. Uh, I, I do I do believe that the uh, energy reserve market or some sort of insurance policy uh, long term makes a lot of sense, and I would like to see that, and I think later uh, commissioners and speakers will uh, probably kind of weigh in on, on that, and I'm expecting them to lend some support. I think they can kind of speak to that concept with 
more authority than I can uh, at this time. But I will say, from my standpoint, I believe that uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm a market uh, a fan, and I believe that that can be done uh, not just in the cost of service framework, but that can be done in the framework that uh, actually elicits multiple participants. It, uh, multiple resource solutions, includes the demand side, includes and recognizes the res reservoir of, of opportunities that are out there and not depends on just one technology, one fuel, or, uh, or one, uh, one, one region. Uh, diversity, I think, is, uh, is an important part of that. Um, I think uh, that uh, there are market design uh, issues. Uh, the, the, I agree with the other presenters that uh, dispatchability is, is critically important, and I think that's an issue of how we construct our markets to encourage and preserve, uh, especially the existing resources that have that, that critical functionality in the short, uh, medium, and I believe the, the longer term. I think that will go a long way. In my mind, that is also a, uh, a design issue. That is, how do we construct the markets to properly and appropriately value and segment the value, distinct value that uh, dispatchable uh, resources uh, can can provide? I, I so, I mean, are you saying this is an accreditation issue then, that it could be solved by some systemic fundamental change to accreditation processes? Is that where you're going with that? I, I, I'm I think there you are. You can see I'm trying to get to specifics here. And so, is that yeah. what you're driving toward? Um, uh, um, it may be. I mean, I, I, I guess I'd have to get behind the uh, accreditation. Uh, I think there are other, other pathways to accomplishing and segmenting markets and uh, recognizing value that may extend beyond the accreditation issue, but I do, I do acknowledge that there's, uh, you know, there's probably sensible opportunity along those lines. So I'm, my, my time is coming to an end here. So I, I'm going to just ramp up with one final thought. I, I'm not, we're going to have to move on to, to the chairman here. But the, the, the reason I keep asking about tariff revisions is simply that, that we, we are looking at a scenario that I began with, which is we are forcing out dispatchables. We're going to have RMRs because the one thing the engineers are going to make sure they can do to the extent it is physically possible is keep the lights on. And I'm beginning to wonder about the tenability of a market mechanism at all that is unable to actually procure the required attributes, I'm not beginning to wonder. I, have, I began to wonder years ago. I am, I am on full-on wondering right now about whether or not this is still tenable. And, and if, if what you're looking at is some bizarre hybrid system in which you have both a market functioning where the states go uh, hell for leather for renewables and they have the backstop of RMR cost-based uh, cost -based gas, basically, what you're doing is partially reintegrating the, the electric system throughout an entire region at untold cost to the consumer uh, in the pursuit of public policy goals, which again, I acknowledge are, are within the state's rights under the FPA, but it just doesn't seem like that's the right way to do things. And so I keep coming back to this point about specificity and possible tariff uh, redesign. But anyway, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the indulgence with all that time there. Thank you, Commissioner Danley. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions and turn back to you, Commissioner Christie, if you have any questions and others as well as, and back to you, Commissioner Danley, as well, if we have time. Um, I want to start with uh, fuel oil, uh, something we really haven't talked much today. And Mr. Nolan, maybe uh, I, can, I can direct my first question at you. So I understand the situation. New England, unlike every other region in the country, has a substantial amount. Well, I don't know about, uh, I, I shouldn't talk about other regions of the country. But in New England, you have a substantial amount of dual fuel generation, as well as a generation that just runs uh, solely on fuel oil. And um, it's not necessarily the greatest for the environment. But it does provide a, 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 an opportunity for, for, uh, for from a reliability perspective, and also, an, I guess, an economic perspective and he hedging if, if there's too much um, if gas prices go too high. Um, and uh, I think there's, if I'm correct if I'm wrong, I think there's like 6,000 megawatts of dual fuel and maybe another 6,000 megawatts of fuel oil only generation. Is that, that's, that's about right. Approximately correct, yes, sir. So. Um, one of the things that, that, that is alarming is I see some of the, the reports that the ISO puts out, and um, although the numbers are improving, but we're talking about um, uh, storage, on-site storage. Not everyone, uh, some of the plants have a lot of storage capability, fuel oil storage capability, some only have, have a little, and I understand that part. But these plants are getting paid for being available. There's a, you know, the, the pay there's a pay performance program that penalizes you if you don't perform, but essentially you're getting capacity payments and, and only when the paper performance 
program kicks in, essentially, as I understand it, uh, which I think has only kicked in once, if I remember, like a Labor Day a few years ago. That's correct. Um, you know, then, you, then you get penalized if you don't show up. But you, if, if you don't think you're going to get the paid performance is going to kick in, you can kind of gamble on the system. And I think that's kind of what's happened, because I understand there's about 50 percent of, the, of these facilities that use fuel oil, 50 percent of the storage capacity is full, or will be full before we start the winter, which means 50 percent won't be. Now, you can say, well, you can go out and get the fuel oil, you can get it barged in, truck, or trucked in, or whatever. But as I understand it, a lot of, when you need the uh, energy, it's often when it's cold, when it's icy, uh, uh, there may not be truckers, there may, the roads may uh, be impassable, things like that. So what, what from, I, I just want to ask you first, what is it that we can do to, um, and I know there was a program several years ago that, that it's expired, subsequently expired, uh, to essentially pay for um, uh, these uh, uh, you know, storage on site, or at least the descent storage on site through payments. But how about from a pay performance perspective, why are we allowing for companies or generators to get capacity payments when they may not actually have the fuel available when they're needed? So the, <clears throat> there have been oil inventory programs in the past uh, that were coupled together with LNG contracting programs in, in the same years. And we haven't had one since 2017, 2018. Um, and we've had relatively mild winters since then, including last year when we burned 80 million gallons of oil and, and just 20 million less than the, the year where we had that coal snap. Last year was a relatively mild winter. Um, if, if a generator that has oil, or that, that has an oil tank that, that is empty, and they're unable to perform, uh, then, then that gener generator would be, would be out of service when it comes to the operating day. Uh, that would have impact on their, their future availability. And I, and I understand that there, are, that there are projects that are, that are ongoing right now to, to change the way capacity is, is, is accredited, and, and I, I don't have enough detail on that to speak intelligently about it, so I won't. But um, we do see the, for at least for this winter, we do see that the that the, pro, the the oil replenishment is going to be key. The oil replenishment is going to be expected. Right now, we're around 80 million gallons in the tanks, and we expect to, based on conversations that we've had, outreach that we've had with with the generator owners uh, of the oil tanks, uh, we, we expect them to be f around 110 million to start the uh, to start the to start this coming winter. That's all based on. The, the expectations from the backwardation of the oil markets where the prices are expected to be lower as we get closer to winter. That's why it's as low as it is now, and it's September. Winter's close. Um, we, we expect those oil tanks to be filled up. We have a lot of storage capacity in the generators that were built in the seven, 1970s, um, and, and those are at risk. Uh, those are at risk for retirement, so it comes back to you know, RMR contracting to keep them around, and I don't have the answer to that. Uh, I just see that those are generators that are, that are at risk, and those are the big tanks. They can run for weeks uh, on, on one tank full, and they can be replenished fairly easily as they're uh, situated close to, uh, close to water where barges can come in with a, with a large quantity. Otherwise, we're replenishing smaller tanks with, uh, with trucks, and you mentioned that, uh, that trucking is an issue, and, and one, one of the solutions that is, is hardly a solution, but we've, we've discussed in the past, and we've, we've done this, is, is the extension of truck driver hours that we're allowed to drive oil to tanks, and you know, trucker shortages and infrastructure shortages, and lo the logistics is, is, is a challenge. Uh, as far as the pay for performance event only happening once, you're right, it did only happen once, and it was on Labor Day, and that was just, that was five years ago this year. Um, and may, <clears throat> maybe more PFP events may or may not incent behavior. Uh, the fact that there is a possibility for a PFP event anytime, any day, for a number of reasons, not just the, uh, the unavailability of fuel, uh, is the incentive that we're counting on for having the units, the generators, uh, have the fuel that they need to produce. So, and I want to get to Mr. Kevin in a second, but I want to, just on that point, I think the fuel oil, the, the companies that are storing the fuel oil, or, or the facility owners, are saying to themselves, well, okay, I can get dinged under pay for performance. On the other hand, if it's a mild winter and I buy all this fuel oil and I store it on site, then, and I've stuck with it at the end of the winter, I paid a lot of money for oil, let's say oil prices go down, 
then I, I lose out economically because I don't really have the fear that pay performance is really going to kick in. And I would say that's, I think, one thing we need to take a look at is the pay performance program. Is, is it really instilling the fear of God in people, so to speak, to do the right thing to make sure that when they're actually, again, if you're going to get paid, I always thought, if you're going to get a capacity payment, you better be there when you're called upon. And I don't think we're guaranteeing that. That's a concern. I want to, Mr. Cavanaugh, I want to give you an opportunity. If I could just make one, one more point on that. Um, well, well there, again, there was one event. Uh, we do rely, and it's not a market mechanism at all. It's a situational awareness mechanism. And, and Stephen George on the, the first panel mentioned our 21-day energy analysis. That analysis was designed to give that forewarning of the potential for uh, a PFP event with enough time to make the arrangements to get the oil delivery or to potentially, uh, at, at least back when the, uh, when, when the analysis was designed and developed, to, to arrange for LNG cargoes. And I understand that that's much more difficult than it was uh, based on, on world events. Um, but the, the analysis is at least geared to provide the awareness that there is that potential for that event and, and to show not only the generators, but the, the states, the PUCs, the people of New England, that we are at risk, and that risk is then real. You know, we can talk about that in a postulated event like today, looking at three winters from now. What I'm talking about is two weeks from now, What's good, what it looks like two weeks from now. So now it, that's, that's when it starts to really become real, and we can start to take the actions that we need uh, to reduce the impact or potentially even uh, mitigate the event altogether. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chairman. You know, really good question. When you look at, I think, about 54% of the total fuel in the region is in five stations. Those are residual fuel plants. Uh, over my 37 years of, of doing this, um, I happen to work for some of those folks at times. So an asset manager that has a less than 1% capacity factor on an annual basis is not going to go out and fill its tank in a backward-dated fuel market. Their replacement will unwind that position at some point in time, but it's just not prudent management of the resource. So, you know, you look at heading into the winter at 50%, and you look at these units that are, you know, certainly looking at PFP risk. I mean, they're, they're going to value that with the monthly stop-loss provisions, annual stop-loss provisions, and the, the possibility of occurrence being low. Again, they're not going to overly fill their tanks with the expectation. We don't control weather, and I think the ISO did a fine job of analyzing this winter. We're concerned, public power is concerned this winter, every winter, that we don't have the resources in place to manage those colder periods. Understanding, if you look back in 2018, that program was $25 million. It's five times that now because the world market on fuels is way up. It's expensive, but it's like any hedge. It's great when you have it. It's terrible when you don't. And so... Um, you know, it, it provides some period of relief. And if, it's, if the system needs it for 10 hours, that might be to 10 critical hours. So long answer to your question, those are still valuable balancing resources. Some of them retire in 2016. Some of them are not accessible by barge. So moving residual fuel oil in the winter for those that have worked in resid plants, it's not easy. So uh, the refueling during the period is tough. So um, costly, but a hedge nonetheless. Thank you. So the question gets at really the major weakness and one of the reasons why we are here in terms of we're in a very infrastructure constrained area from an energy perspective, but we have a situation that's relying on short term resources. So just using the LDC example, we're filling our inventories for underground storage. This is going into this winter, we're filling our LNG tanks. We've pre-planned for contracts for LNG coming in from Everett, from Repsol, et cetera. We, and we've done that over the years, and we do that as in accordance with our model that, you know, that fosters reliability. So I think the answer to the question is the electric industry needs to also pre-plan because the LNG tanker might be 2,000 miles away. There might not be 900 or so tanker trucks available to refill storages for oil that are that's getting depleted rapidly during a cold weather, weather event. So the key is pre-planning and a funding mechanism to fund the cost associated with that pre-planning effort. But when, when you don't uh, acquire sufficient resources for the upcoming winter and you're out of gas, 
I, I assume your state regulator is going to take it out on you, but also the, I mean, the, you're, you're, the, the, it, you have an incentive not to do that, and I just don't know if there's enough of a financial incentive to make sure that there's enough fuel oil on site. But I want to move on to it to a second question, Mr. Paglia. You, 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 you hit it right when you said, I think you said you've been doing this a long time and we've been, this, this is not the first conference where this, these issues have been discussed. And one of the issues is, has been, it's been a long standing discussion about how to get additional uh, pipeline, get natural gas pipeline capacity built. And I'm just curious if that, if, the, if that's even possible in New England. There's several reasons. One of which we've talked about the contractual issues of the generators not willing to sign long-term precedent agreements. And that's understandable when you think about it because you know, I, I, former Commissioner Keller, I've quoted him on this several times, he's, he mentioned this to Congress once. He says, well, you really, I mean, you're talking about gas maybe a handful of days, maybe 14 days where the generators really needed on the really coldest days. Why are they going to sign, you know, long-term firm take or pay contracts? And that's what the, I assume, companies like Enbridge, you really require that to finance these projects. Yeah. So, so just to, just to finish up on that. So, so um, you know, we, we had that. We had there was an alternative discussion a number of years ago, um, where there was an effort to try to get the electric rate payers to pay for, uh, uh, you know, through a, a charge charge mechanism to to pay for uh, uh, pipeline contracts or pipelines. That I think was was I think the Massachusetts Supreme Court I think it was Correct. outlawed that. And then of course there's just not I mean there's not a lot of interest. Uh, among the states and bring in. So, so I'm wondering, uh, is, is it something we should just look at alternatives? Or is there really an opportunity, do you think, a realistic opportunity to bring in more pipeline capacity to the region? Or is this something we need to just look, again, look at alternatives to bring in natural gas, maybe like an electric transmission yeah. line to bring in energy a different way? So I think you retold my career path there in your comments. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, with, in all seriousness, I do believe there are natural gas infrastructure projects. We can build and respect the environmental policy goals, uh, and, but we do need to work together to make that happen, right? We have had successful expansions recently in this region, not without opposition uh, and challenge, but we have built them. The demand is there, so we satisfy the purpose and need construct. Um, as I mentioned, do I think a greenfield pipeline in this region will be built? No, I don't. And I don't think it's necessary, quite frankly. But I do think brownfield development technique we call lift and replace, changing out smaller diameter pipe with larger diameter pipe, adding compression. Um, and Karen mentioned something that I also think is very interesting. There is a growing peak day demand, and that's what LDCs and, and the like contract for. You know, it doesn't matter if you can meet the averages, you need to meet that peak day. And that's what ISO is challenged with as well right now with respect to the fuel for the merchant plants. So there's a lot of ways to satisfy that. Um, I think domestic liquefaction, satellite LNG is an excellent path forward. And we've got a couple projects that we're working towards on that front. I do think mainline expansion on the pipelines is important as well, that brownfield approach with compression and looping, um, again, all executable if there's alignment across the regulator, the policy, and the communities that we'd be doing that in. So that's that's where you know how can how can you potentially help us? I think that's 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 an area where you could, you know, our company and I, I think I could speak for my peer companies are willing to make that investment. We've done it in the past. We've spent capital that we've not recovered. Uh, we stand ready to do that still, but we do need some better clarity on the path forward. Uh, and, and I think there, there could be a role, there is a role for FERC to play in that. So hopefully that was responsive to your question. Thank you. Um, it was just in your response to, is it possible um, to build new infrastructure? I wanted to um, maybe give more clarity around, I think all the sol solutions, no matter what infrastructure it is that you're talking about, whether it's saving Everett, whether it's building a pipe, whether it's, uh, you know, building on-site um, liquefaction, all of them still require a mechanism behind that to ensure that fuel is provided to the facility. So all of the infrastructure issues also are dependent upon the ability of the market to go out and contract for the fuel. Oh, sorry. 
Um, thank you. I was just going to add that all of the infrastructure it, that we've talking about, it takes time to get there. And there are delays and cost overruns that, you know, can happen along the way. Doesn't mean that it shouldn't be pursued. But I hope people understand that there's a near-term issue, um, at least with the Everett facility. It shouldn't come to as any surprise. Um, I think Levitan um, analyzed this back in, you know, 2018, that without Mystic, the anchor tenant for the Everett facility, there's severe financial challenges. And um, none of the, you know, ISO New England market design um, fixes, um, you know, that were discussed here, they, we've looked at SE, that doesn't make a difference for Everett, right? Um, so, I'm, I'm hoping in addition to talking about what's the overall plan and what's the long term, I, I think we need to talk about whether people want Everett to be a bridge to that long term future. Do we want to, you know, does New England want to retain it? And if so, uh, we don't have that much time. We have no commitments post cost of service that would require us to keep operating. So we're faced with a choice and it's coming on us very soon. Um, as to what to do, and I just, so I just want a little bit for us to keep focus on near, medium, and long-term solutions. Can, can I ask a follow-up question on that with regard to, um, you, and I want to make sure, I, I want to make sure we don't uh, impede any standing proceeding, I don't think we will, by this question, but um, why, you just said why, so it's not economic, without keeping Mystic open, it's not economic to have, ever, to keep Everett open. Now, I know obviously Everett supplies a substantial amount of gas to, to Mystic, which is what, 1,200 megawatts to generate, eight, eight and nine or 1,200 megawatts or so. Um, 1,400. 1,400, I apologize, so I'm off, off by a couple hundred. Um, wh why, why, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of need for gas in, in the region. Why is it that, it, that, that, why isn't there, from an LDC perspective and from other generators? So we have had a lot of interest in contracting, and it was really what I was trying to get at earlier with my comments about um, getting the regulatory process out of the way, like doing enough due diligence to make sure that the regulators feel comfortable, that they're doing their job, they're satisfying their statutory standard, but making sure that people don't have the false impression that a contract with, a, you know, Everett with Constellation needs to follow a particular format in order for it to be approved. And so we have a lot of interest, um, you know, we've had expressions of interest for contracting and securing the future, uh, something that would replace um, Mystic. I think it's going to take a number of LDCs, perhaps the pipelines, coming together to find a way to support it if that's what they want to do. Um, uh, but we also need to kind of solve the regulatory hurdles, and I think, I mean, as a regulatory attorney for 25 years, I look at this and I say, this is something you guys could fix, right? You can, you could help with this. And I would imagine if I were sitting in your shoes, I would want to know what I could actually do um, to make a difference. I just want to ask one, one last question turn to Commissioner Christie. Commissioner Allen, um, you know, we, and you are very generous with your time in terms of the, the, the joint state task force we have on transmission. And, uh, you know, I, I've, Seen from afar, there's a lot of letters that go back and forth between the NESCO, NESCO and, and the, uh, the, 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 for the to help facilitate the states in terms of this whole process, especially as it relates to the fact that state policies and you know different people have different views as, as to what the, the positivity of those state policies, but state policies obviously having a big impact in this whole debate uh, in terms of the future and then moving towards the clean energy future. What can FERC do to help facilitate the states in terms of the, your views and, and participating in the process? I'm sorry. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think this is an opportunity for me to make a few points that I, I kind of wanted to make uh, overall. And then one is that, um, you know, we, we talked about the end game. Right? What, what are the uh, kind of the uh, open uh, pathways to essentially getting off the spin cycle, as uh, um, Commissioner Clement uh, referred to? And I, I think that includes or other things that we can do, and so there, there are certainly kind of following in the normal uh, course of events. Uh, I think there, I think you are frankly doing uh, certain things. I think in uh, the order 2222, I think you're helping to kind of engage uh, and 
uh, enable, empower uh, new agents to uh, participate in uh, the regional market that can provide, uh, I think, Im important uh, uh, pathways forward. Uh, from my, my standpoint, I, I think there are kind of three broad things that I want to talk about that were not that weren't so much about the end game, dispatchability and uh, the reserve, but recognizing that I think we can we can uh, significantly reduce the uh, the size of the uh, the challenge by doing certain things, and those things include uh, the transmission. So the transmission, I think, opening corridors, offshore corridors, and I think FERC is actually taking major steps in a very positive direction to help you know empower the regions to. Uh, do and the states uh, uh, through the the direction guidance you've given to uh, entities like um, NESCO that, that could potentially play a role in facilitating uh, solutions and you know allowing the states to essentially work amongst themselves in a very collaborative uh, fashion I think as is uh, currently being contemplated and uh, being able to essentially receive and approve um, Projects. Um, I'm, you know, now I'm thinking of uh, transmission again. But th there are, you know, there there is that encouragement and uh, creating the open doors and opportunities, such as is being pursued through the rulemaking. Uh, consumer demand is a uh, an issue. I actually, I mean, really playing to you know my my concern is the growth. We haven't really seen growth within the region in really decades. Um, I think uh, 2005 is the last peak in uh, New England, and uh, here we are, you know, f we're, we're forecasting load growth. Where's the load growth coming from? It's coming from electrification. Electrification, I think, is now becoming a, a consumer-driven uh, issue. It's not, I think it's, it's really beyond state control. It's, uh, I, you know, it, there, there are new incentives at the federal level. But I think recognizing that uh, essentially with those new loads comes uh, an inherent risk of uh, significant growth out beyond essentially what is being uh, forecasted. Uh, but there is also a silver lining there, and that is uh, the role that demand response can play. So again, I think we're coming back to market design and the role that the uh, FERC can play in essentially enabling and empower the um, market designs that allow for what is often the least cost uh, 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 source uh, resource, which is a demand side or, or energy efficiency. And then, just more more broadly, it's uh, it's market reforms. I think you know we're going through uh, I think an excellent cycle uh, in uh, New England of our external market monitor helping to facilitate and identify uh, market reforms that are. Uh, potentially viable and uh, have, um, you know, se seem to have a apparent, uh, you know, uh, rationale. I think those uh, those reforms improve the efficiency of, uh, potentially improve the efficiency of the markets by segmenting markets in ways that more uh, provide more focus on, you know, the real, you know, the real risks uh, to reliability. And the uh, the system, and I, I don't want to go off on. I think uh, the external market monitor will be on the next panel and can kind of speak to those more ably than I can. But uh, I think they're, you know, allowing, recognizing, encouraging uh, the market reforms that are needed to essentially lay, uh, uh, resize or reduce the challenge that is in, in front of me. Thanks for that open-ended question. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm going to move on to. Uh Commissioner Christie. Uh, yeah, I've got a ton of questions, but once again, I'm going to sh show some discipline and not, not ask right now since we're right in front of lunch. But uh, I'll save him for a later panel. Thank you. Sorry. We're going to go back to Commissioner Danley. So this, the, I, I don't want to belabor the point here, but the, 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 this panel in part is on short-term solutions. And my question is just, does anybody have any ideas for anything that can be done by th that we have responsibility over for this winter. And if there's nothing that you have immediately, that's fine, but I'm just soliciting because that's part of what we should be getting on the record here. Any thoughts from anybody? Immediate things that can be done that FERC can actually approve or, or disapprove? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the question. Certainly, we, we look in the ISO digit analysis on the winter program. We, we still think there's some value in there, um, perhaps limited, but what we don't know is the exposure. When we get beyond a moderate winter, we get into a you know, more 2013, 2014 winter, what solution, what winter program might provide some coverage? I know the ISO has done an extensive look at this, but there's still for my folks to say, yeah, there's a hedge there. There's, there's ability to mitigate some hours perhaps. Um, we know that's limited, but um, that for, for us, that would be the uh, only really short-term issue that could be put into play. Um, I was gonna jokingly say, uh, pray for warm weather. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, and in absence of putting the reliability on the backs of hope, you need to fill the LNG tanks. Um, make sure that you have enough fuel to make it through your peak days. Um, don't assume that you're gonna have a mild winter. You plan and you make sure that there's enough fuel in there for at least 10 days. Just to provide background, um, if we do have a mild winter, we, we do expect to be able to operate reliably through it. Even if in a moderate winter, we would expect to re reliably operate through it. But if we have a winter like 2013, 2014, we expect to need, in addition to the oil that, that would be burned over the course of that type of winter, 50, 50 BCF of LNG, not just for generation, uh, but, but for gas demand as well. Because we, mo we model that as part of our analysis. And, and that, that equates to if it were to just be for, for generation. And, and again, this is just accentuating your point, uh, six, six, six and a quarter terawatt hours of, of energy, if, if that were to be the case. So 50 BCF is a lot of LNG, especially today. Um, while I'm not answering your question, I understand that, uh, but, but I'm hoping to put a finer point on what your question actually is. No, I appreciate you. You're actually telling me the question that I was asking, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would agree with Karen. Our, our, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, our, our hands are tied short term. We don't have a whole lot of tools in the toolbox left, at least on the gas side. LNG, making sure we have adequate supply is about it. And that I would just offer from there, if we can secure it, given everything going on, we best be ready to speak to the cost implications that are going to roll through next year, because that's going to be devastating. Yeah. Even, even if we make it through with uh, right, right. With the, the, the best case scenario of a bad winter is terrible rate shock. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes, um, from an LDC perspective, I'm going to I'm going to echo that. Uh, so the the ISO has indicated that the region is dependent upon LNG, and we know that's the case because of the nature of the infrastructure limitations, but nothing has been done about it. And so now there's a risk. And because the, we're dependent upon, from an electric power perspective at this point, LNG, it hopefully wouldn't be too late to do an RFP to the import terminals or suppliers to try to arrange some uh, cargos that could be there as, a, as an insurance policy. So at this point, either that or oil are really the only um, available options uh, other than other than public outreach and uh, more possible conservation measures, et cetera. But LNG seems to be the one that has the, the biggest impact and possibly most impactful, beneficial impact to uh, our situation. Okay. I was going to say, um, although my focus is largely, you know, what happens after the cost of service, I'm not, um, I'm very aware of, you know, um, what the prices could mean for people in New England. I was raised um, a single salary household, a teacher at that, right? So I get it. Um, by the same token, I have this perspective as the chief regulatory lawyer for my company. I just finished handling all of the litigation and fallout from Winter Storm Uri. So that's the worst situation. You have sky high prices and people dying, right? So I think we need to, to think about that in terms of, you know, what are we going to do short, medium, and long term? Because I understand, I mean, Commissioner Danley was asking, like, how are we going to get just and reasonable rates? And that's, that's very important. Um, but, you know, if you're not careful and you're too short-sighted about things, you can end up with that exactly what you were trying to prevent and additional, you know, 
untold consequences as well. So, um, you know, it's just something that we're thinking about here and we're trying to figure out, you know, what is it that the New England region really wants to do for that period until additional infrastructure can get built? Commissioner Allen. Sure, I'll, I'll just um, say I, th I think um, in, in part you're, you're doing it by showing up. I mean, this is, you know, this is a significant issue. I, th I think you've elevated and helped to kind of reinforce the importance, the critical importance of this by, uh, by showing up. I think in terms of what, you know, on our side, what uh, the uh, distribution utilities and others can do is, uh, and uh, state officials are, uh, um, it's really communications. It's working closely with ISO to provide the messaging at the appropriate time, uh, uh, including the uh, what they are doing, uh, the 21-day uh, kind of uh, preparedness uh, and forecasting that is uh, needed. The uh, utilities, um, you know, need to be working uh, in uh, the preparedness process. So they need to engage and practice and drill and, uh, you know, uh, prepare for the worst, but uh, hope for the best. Thank you. And, and, and thinking of sticker shock, so when you look at the options, if, you, if it's an oil and LNG combination, if the average multi-year view of LNG is 30 BCF delivery to the region and we're running into a 50% entry into oil, that's 100 million gallons deficit, then from a consumer perspective, I would say as we look at short-term solutions, what is the right sizing of those volumes to make sure that we manage the exposure but also manage the rate impact, just for consideration? Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Danley. So we're going to take a, a, a break for lunch right now and uh, come back with our third panel at 1.30. I want to just thank all of you. This is a very helpful discussion. Appreciate you taking the time today to do it.